Nicholas Bornos of Capital Link, I would like to welcome you uh, to the dry bulk sector panel. We have with us the CEOs of major dry bulk shipping companies, and uh, the panel is uh, moderated by Jorgen Lien of DNB Markets, our partner in putting uh, today's conference. Uh, clearly, the dry bulk sector is uh, on fire, uh, but I think what we're going to discuss is this is a market that has a very positive outlook. Uh, and uh, this is a market that, uh, as we are going to analyze, has legs. And uh, hopefully, this uh, momentum will continue for quite some time. So, without any more delay, I will turn it over to Jorgen. And I'd like to thank each one of you for joining today's panel. And again, the uh, online uh, aspect of this event. On one hand, we cannot see each other and uh, shake hands, but we are bringing together uh, industry leaders from all over the world, uh, Singapore, uh, Greece, Monaco, New York, and uh, Cyprus, and so on. So Norway, so thank you to everybody. Thank you, and thank you, Nicholas. Um, and, uh... Uh, with that, I, I, I think we'll just uh, kick off. Thanks to, to all of you for joining the panel. I'll try to direct questions um, ar around the, the table, uh, so to say, uh, going forward and, and, and look forward to the next, uh, the next 50 minutes that we have for, uh, for, for, for this panel. Uh, so um, just uh, as Nicholas started, uh, the sector is definitely on fire. Uh, things uh, have been moving in the right direction for a long time now. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I guess just to start off, um, if you want to put your finger on, on the one single thing uh, that's really spurred this uh, freight market to the current uh, levels, um, what has that been? And I will go around the table and I think we'll start with, with John Michael uh, for good book. Um, I, actually, I would say probably COVID nineteen and all the uh, and all the um, governmental initiative stimulus that has come with that, right? On the demand side and on the supply side, the same thing because you see, we've all talked about quarantines, um, sh ships in queues, and that's a result really of COVID precautionary measures. So. On the demand side, it's helped us, uh, boosted with, with by infrastructure stimulus. And on the supply side, we are waiting in queues to get to go through quarantines. And I don't think that ends either ends anytime soon. All right. Um, and um, what about you, Gary? Um, Gary for the big book. Yeah, thanks, Jurgen. Well, you know, I agree. There's, there's clearly a number of drivers at the moment, and, and you can point to COVID. And, and some of the responses that have acted really as a catalyst. Having said that, you know, I believe we've been in a cyclical recovery since the market bottomed out in 2016, um, been interrupted by what I like to call black swan type events. You know, we can list off a litany of them in succession, whether it was Asian swine flu, trade war tariffs on soybeans, the Bali Dam collapse, obviously COVID and a collapse of crude and fuel spreads for those of us with scrubbers. But, but we've now, with those behind us, we're starting to see, you know, some of these exogenous forces, which are positive and congestion clearly is, has been a driver. But underneath that, you know, we believe there's a fundamental strength to this market um, that's been developing uh, as the order book has dwindled, you know, over the last number of years. All right, thank you, Gary. Um, and uh, just uh, just uh, building uh, building a bit on that uh, to, to you, Martin, um, has a uh, uh, and, and also a bit back to what John Michael said, I guess, how, how, is, um, how is congestion uh, a factor in your eyes as to the recovery that we've seen um, and, and how, I guess, sustainable is that uh, once we get beyond that stage where we might be today? It, it all contributes, as both John Michael and Gary said, I, I think we almost in some ways have the most perfect storm. We, we started off with COVID, the recovery. Um, we got all the quarantine, all, all the issues, you had add that into that, the Australia-China trade war, China getting coal from further afield, still moving into America, stretching the fleets, completely new trades. And then you overlay it with, especially on the smaller size of the liner side, massive congestion rates through the roof there, bulk, uh, sorry, bulk coming out of containers back in. And we have this most amazing kind of perfection going on at the moment. And, and now with all the Northern Hemisphere uh, energy issues, and it's uh, 
looks like it's dear old going to have to come to the rescue. He can't make it up with the Vostokny coal uh, supply or, or stockpiles on fire as of three three days ago. I mean, it's all filtering into, yeah, one hell of an end of the year. So it's been a combination. And, uh, and, and everywhere we look at the moment, it's all adding it into a great market. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then um, if I direct the, the question to, to Polis uh, Hodgiano um, with, uh, with safe bulkers, um, uh, maybe per perhaps I think uh, something that's worth mentioning a bit is, is the, the disruptions that you've seen on the coal side um, related to this uh, China-Australia uh, uh, rhetoric uh, on, on the import of coal. Um, how do you think that uh, has has impacted the current situation, and and, and what sort of your view on uh, on where that stands today, and how we're looking ahead? Uh, I think first of all, the recovery of the market was expected. Uh, the force of the recovery was not expected to this uh, extent, but we were expecting strong recovery post COVID with the stimulus uh, uh, programs announced both east and west, both from China and other countries, and also the US. And on the, on the supply side, the market was huge, hugely undersupplied since we had six or seven years of terrible markets. So we were expecting a strong recovery. Probably last, this time last year, we were expecting market of, of uh, to have this year around $20,000 a day on the Panamaxes. It's almost uh, double now. Uh, and uh, as far as the coal is concerned, I think the Chinese and the Indians are running on very low stocks. They are in need of the coal. Of course, they are promoting, uh, they are promoting uh, the environment and they are protecting uh, the environment, but I don't think they can implement it uh, very soon. So they will need to import uh, more coal. And uh, I think this would be the key driver for, for the next six months. I think coal movement into, into the major countries. Uh, we have winter coming upon us. And uh, we have, uh, it's the first time I remember for many, many years, shortages of coal before the winter starts. So I think this can be only positive for the dry bulk market. Now, now this is a... This is the most important thing. Of course, COVID is helping all this uh, to fuel up all this uh, to the current extent, the delays due to COVID. All right, thank you. And uh, then finally for Stamatis Santanis uh, of um, Synergy Maritime Holdings is, uh, I, we, we've touched on a lot of points. I don't know if there's anything in particular to add, but uh, I guess uh, a, a good question and that gained some headlines just a few weeks back was the, the spillover on, uh, on, on these containers uh, and uh, some Cape size uh, owners that were looking into carrying them around uh, as potentially backhaul cargoes. Is that something that you've been looking into or, uh, or is that too, too much of a niche? Well, again, from my side, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> as far as um, the previous uh, points uh, were discussed, I need to say that uh, for the Cape size uh, trade that we're doing, we do not see uh, congestion to play such a big role. Uh, I mean, it used to be around 12, 13 uh, percent a few years ago and still is at the same levels. Maybe it has gone up like one or two percent, but we don't really see congestion on the Capes. Uh, the turnover of ships either in Brazil or in China or in Australia is pretty much the same. So we don't really see any changes in congestion. So at the same time, uh, and a very important point here is that not only we have not seen the congestion as everybody says that there's congestion, we don't really see that. But the most important point is that the fleet speeds have gone up by at least two knots. So on average, our fleet was going between 11 and 12 knots a couple of years ago. Right now it's going <laughs> at maximum speed. I mean, 13, 14, 14 and a half. So all the charters have given instructions. So right now you have a market which is at $80,000 a day with congestion not being a particular issue. And at the same time, the fleet going uh, almost maximum speed. So that can really tell you how tight the balance is. And uh, you know that gives a very good explanation of <clears throat> how critical that is. Now, as far as containers on, on, on dry bulks. I, I really cannot comment. We have not seen that happening on capes in our fleet. Uh, I know that other companies are exploring this opportunity, but that's something that we have not really 
seen as a mother and father. Yeah, well, that's an interesting observation. So, uh, in in terms of uh, what what has really then sparked everything, if not congestion, just uh, a revamp of volumes uh, in general. Well, yes. I mean, obviously, you have the the emergence of coal. We used to do ten out of our sorry, two out of our ten uh, charters were in uh, in coal, and the rest was uh, iron ore. Right now, is uh, is is fully balanced, uh, 50 50 I would say, between coal. And iron. Also, the ton mile demand has grown exponentially the last uh, year or so. So you see a lot of uh, uh, a lot of tonnage has been absorbed in the coal trade, uh, supplying um, critical, uh, you know, low inventories like uh, Polly said before uh, in China and in India. But not only there. I mean, you say you have a lot of imports of coal in Europe. So there are so many coal trades these days happening on capes that are not uh, fully laden. I mean, we do a lot of trips at 115,000 deadweight tons of coal out of uh, Mobile, Alabama. So we do all these all these interesting trades that were not uh, were not available a few years ago. All right, interesting. And uh, turning a bit back to any potential spillover effects uh, f from container cargoes, as I guess the, the current squeeze that you've seen in the container space uh, definitely, you know, motivates some switch over to bulk uh, vessels uh, if uh, possible perhaps um, is that something that um, that you've seen happening and what sort of magnitude is that if we start with uh, with Gary uh, at Eagle yeah so we've seen a significant amount of cargo that I would say is spillover cargo not containerized but what would have gone in containers so we're seeing you know ba bag cement bag chemicals um, that we're carrying primarily to West Coast, Central America, South America. Um, and so these are cargoes not in containers anymore. We've looked into um, the, the ability to carry containers. Um, it's not an insignificant in terms of engineering class approval. So you're, you're, it's, a, it's a significant investment. And then of course, it's, it's specific to the design of the ship. So you really have to make a decision that you wanna do this across your fleet or the chance of the one or two ships you do it for uh, being in position. Is, is pretty unlikely. So we've decided at this point, we're not doing that, but we're definitely the beneficiaries. And, you know, I'd say about 10% of the ships that we're, you know, uh, fixing out of Asia, not, not within, but leaving Asia, what we would historically call backhaul, are carrying cargoes that typically we wouldn't have seen pre, pre COVID and pre the surge in container rates and utilization. All right, thank you. Uh, do you have um, uh, any comment on that uh, on your end, uh, Martin? Um, and uh, I guess what people are asking themselves is: th is this economically driven, or is just just a shortage of containers that that really pushes this sort of volume over to to, to you guys? We actually have uh, a couple of ships running from uh, thirty sevens running from Asia into the US Gulf, uh, looking uh, containers, containerized cargo. And uh, it is specific, as Gary says. It's, I love all the talk about cakes being fitted for containers. It's not going to happen. It, it's very, very specific. It, it's all about the tank top strengths, whether you can actually load the ships. And yes, we had to go to class. Uh, we had to, you know, with, with, with some of the lashings and fittings. It's not something you want to do too many of if you encounter a bad storm, but it is there. It is opportunistic. But what has happened, of course, is that a lot of genuine open hatch box hold ships have been moved in, into the container trades. And of course, all the multi-purpose, all those ships have disappeared into containers. So now people have to come and look, look at it. It's the handies I'm talking about uh, the, that are kind of asking us whether we can do it. But again, it, it's got to pay and we've got to make sure we can do it because you don't want any mistakes. Uh, it, it's not as easy as people think it is, but it's definitely there. And when we, the, the couple of voyages we have done, it paid a big premium, very much so. Yeah. And if, if you'd like to follow up uh, any of you on, is, is this volume that might be sticking around, uh, Gary, just, just quickly? Uh, or, or do you think it's, it's relating a lot to the equipment shortages that you've had, especially maybe in Asia? Uh, I, I, think, I, think, I think this is transitory in quotes, whatever that means, right? I don't think in five years, I mean, if you go back, you know, 75 years, it all went on on, on break bulk. Uh, then it was container. I think it's a matter of container rates are at such a high premium and, and lack of container availability. It's it's economically driven, right? It's more efficient to, to now or cost effective, if you will, to put these on bulk ships, uh, even though you now need to then discharge them into a warehouse and then onto 
trucks and things like that. So I don't think this is here to stay, but how long it is, how long that transitory you know, remains to be seen. I mean, the comments from from the uh, the players in container space would lead you to believe that this is going to be here for quite some time. Yeah, and then John Michael, do you have a comment on that? Uh, no, I I think the containers have are are actually benefiting the dry cargo market, but in in another way too, the container because of the bullish container market, you've seen a lot of new container orders being placed at shipyards, and that soaked up a lot of space that could have gone to dry cargo. So it's even it's almost it's hard for us to screw it up right now until 2023. And then just to go back a step, I think the low order book that we have now and we've had basically going into the pandemic is kind of the foundation for this whole thing. If we didn't have less than call it 7% of the existing fleet on order, we probably would not be in this high high level of a market. Yeah, fair enough. And and just uh, to, to continue a bit on, on the demand side, I think we'll get a bit back to that on, on the supply as well. But uh, um, Given the current market and where we are, uh, there was a major sell-off just some time back uh, relating to what was going on in China and the Evergrande situation. That weighed against what uh, these these global infrastructure uh, initiatives that have been put in place following the pandemic as well. Um, how do you view the outlook and, and risk for, uh, I think, the, the Chinese demand of iron ore is essentially the, the big question. I, I I don't uh, I don't see the Chinese government um, letting their real estate uh, real estate sector bring down their whole economy. So I think they've learned from the from the U.S. Actually, they're not that they're not going to have a Lehman moment. So with that, I I think that the infrastructure will continue to roll out, and their demand for iron ore will continue to roll out. I mean, the one interesting thing about iron ore is it's the only commodity the Chinese have not banned from Australia, right? Including coal, and that that for me tells me it's very essential for them. Yeah, it's uh, the go-to solution usually. So uh, so let's see what uh, what they do going forward. Uh, but I, I share that view. Um, and on uh, just uh, just uh, the current situation that we're in, we touched on it, I know, uh, but the the energy markets that we're seeing uh, with with very high energy prices across uh, all energy carriers, in fact, um, how is that uh, how is that playing into the picture on the demand side these days? Um, and uh, and are there any disruptive events that have sort of a, an amplifying effect uh, in that regards? Uh, if you'd uh, like to take a stab on that police? Look, uh, traditionally when oil prices go up, it's uh, helpful uh, for the market because uh, the fleet uh, usually slows down. Of course, now it's a different era that freight rates are so high that even at, you know, $10 increase on the, on the Brent price or $100 on the fuel cost per, per ton is not affecting uh, is not slowing down the, the ships, uh, charters come and ask for faster speeds, not of course to the extent Stamati said on the capes, on the smaller ships, the Panamaxes or post Panamaxes, maybe we have 20% of the charters asking for faster speeds. Uh, of course, we have to remember that uh, as we approach 2023, we have to be con con conscious about increasing our speeds and increasing our uh, fuel uh, consumption because we have to we we are getting the penalty on our uh, uh, CIEIs or for our fleet so we have to be cautious where and when we give the increased speeds and to whom because you cannot give the whole fleet uh, open ended uh, on faster speeds as this will uh, blemish the records of, of of your fleet and the performance before 2023 now, regarding, regarding uh, the previous questions on the containers, I wanted to comment on that. I, I, I think that the biggest advantage for the dry bulk market is not so much if one or two or 10 ships will carry containers, uh, you know, to help out on, on those situations, which, uh, you know, we don't see it. We do, ourselves, we don't see it. And we had a look around and we had a couple of ships made suitable to carry containers, but we didn't see any inquiries. The biggest advantage for dry bulk out of the containers is that for the first time in many, many years, the, the, 
dry bulk cargoes, the minor bulks that they were carried before or very cheaply on container ships, went back to the handy sized vessels. And the handy sized vessels reached uh, levels of $35,000, $40,000 a day. They have uh, pushed up uh, the Supra's uh, level more than, uh, than uh, in the past. And we have seen a recovery in the dry bulk market starting from, for the first time from the lower sizes to the bigger sizes. So this is the biggest contribution we have received from the container boom, is that uh, the recovery on the dry bulk started from the smaller sizes to the bigger sizes. And this for me is the biggest benefit because in the past, when we had our sizes improving from Capes and then Panamaxes, and then Ultramaxis, uh, there were many other sizes of ships that they were taking cargoes away from, uh, from the mid-size into the smaller sizes and the market was correcting relatively quickly. Now, because the boom is starting from the lower sizes, we enjoy a bigger benefit. And I think this is to last because the e-commerce and the orders after COVID by all of us, uh, you know, who are even me that I'm not uh, very friendly with the with ordering via computers. I've started ordering a few things with, uh, with uh, these people, uh, how you call them, the Amazons and these people of the, the people of, uh, of the electronic trade. The ships are there to carry the stuff, but the ports have not expanding in such a dramatic fashion to take care of all this container boom that is happening. So the lorries and the trucks have to get into, in, you have the ships, but you don't have the ports. The lorries and the trucks have to get back through the same gates into the ports and carry in and out the container ships. And I think that also the current boom of the ordering in the containers is not going to affect dramatically the container market because the boom is seen on the big size vessels, which can go in particular ports. When I order or my daughters or my sons, they order... Uh, uh, they are playstations or whatever they order in uh, from the internet they need smaller containers as well to carry the extra trade into much many more ports than uh, those that the 20,000 TEUs are going so i believe the container market is here to stay for a number of years not of course to the current levels but to very very substantial uh, levels simply because the smaller ports uh, they are not there will not be enough ships built to to comply with the trade of the required into the smaller ports yeah you mentioned so i the... think this is the biggest advantage we get at the moment in the dry yeah. bulk market all right thank you and you you mentioned the, the strength of the smaller vessels which have really catapulted the the entire dry bulk recovery this time around um, and seems quite unique uh, is it, but you, you also mentioned St Stanotis, uh, that uh, uh, you had these uh, special or, or call it uh, more unusual cargoes that you lifted for instance out of the US is this a, something that you see a lot uh, in terms of the spillover from the smaller sizes since the availability of those kinds of vessels have been a bit more off the table than usual well unusual i mean they're they're unusual for the last 5 years if you look back in history obviously you know you had all this kind of uh, cargo trades in the past so that's unusual for the last uh, few years that we were all focusing in iron ore and the weather in Brazil and all that, which was <laughs> like the bellwether of, uh, of the trade of the capes. Uh, right now we're seeing uh, bigger diversity. We have a lot of uh, uh, cargo trades, uh, you know, all over the place. So, um, and, and you don't necessarily feel uh, the whole vessel, as I said before. I mean, we do a lot of trades with 115, 125, 145, you know, so you don't really transport the full capacity of the Cape, especially if it's uh, if it's a cold trade. And we also do a lot of Panama Canal crossings with the Capes. We've done it so many times, um, doing, uh, you know, Central America to, to the Far East uh, via the Panama Canal on a, on, a, on a, you know, smaller quantity of cargo. So that's something that we see a lot. Uh, I'm pretty sure that this thing existed uh, in, in, in the previous years uh, where you didn't have such a big uh, C3 and C5 uh, waiting on uh, on the indexes and the indices, but right now we're seeing all this uh, diversity on on cargo trades. All right, thank you. I think uh, if we head a bit more over over to the supply side um, and allow you to start, uh, perhaps John Michael, uh, on the uh, the perspective that you guys have now uh, on uh, potentially ordering vessels. Um, 
uh, and if that's something that that you're looking at or if there's uh, what's what's the other alternatives uh, if if you'd like to grow at the moment absolutely not on new buildings i see no reason to oversupply our market the reason why we're in this place is because we we had restraint on new building orders so don't go out and make the same mistake now if you don't weigh second and third order consequences right which if you order a new building de facto you don't um you should you should you should look at the costs right so the new building cost and a five-year-old of a panamax and supermax are about the same but you buy a panamax and supermax now you can lock it in at say 40 grand for a year you have a new building in 2023 you can lock it in at fifteen thousand dollars a day so the opportunity cost of ordering a new building if you only care about yourself is just way too high it doesn't make financial sense and if you want to get again if you want to invest and get long this market buy a secondhand chip you have tons of optionality the other thing you can't do with a new building is you can't really sell it you buy a secondhand chip maybe you made a boo-boo maybe you feel uncomfortable with it you go into the secondhand market and you get rid of it a new building you're like a deer with in front of headlights that's my opinion <laughs> thank you uh, you can, you can go on gary Maybe I can just jump in because I, I, I fully agree with, with John Michael and I think I've been pretty vocal uh, for the last six years about us not adding to the order book. And, and even though you could argue now that, that the order book is quite low, the economics are pretty, pretty compelling to the secondhand vessels. Aside from that, if you order a ship today that comes in 2023, 24, that ship's only gonna be 11 years old in 2035. The uncertainty around carbon decarbonization and, and carbon taxation. And that ship, given the historic lifespan of dry bulk ships at 25 years, will need to sail right up to 2050, where we may be looking uh, more, more likely that we're gonna be going towards a zero carbon emission target by 2050. So aside from all the reasons that John Michael mentioned, and I fully support it, you know, from the standpoint, I, I believe, and I said this yesterday on a panel, I think every new building decision is a decarbonization opportunity and building a ship to burn, you know, carbon fuel, a new building today, you know, waiting, waiting and understanding what's available in terms of zero emission ships in just a couple of years, I think is a huge opportunity. And I think we all should focus on that opportunity um, as, as we look as an industry of what we're going to do to get to zero emission in the foreseeable future. Yeah, thank you, Gary. And I think that's been that's been part of the story this time around. That uh, perhaps the the asset values have essentially been been lagging what's been going on. So uh, I, I did quickly sort of come to the conclusion that, as you say as well, if you want this exposure, then then why not go for the second hand vessel and. If you look traditionally in shipping as well, uh, you can make the argument that investing in a, an older vessel is perhaps uh, perhaps the, the way to go in terms of sweating the asset and getting the cash returns. But uh, how, how is the, in terms of the public markets, and I'll leave this open to, to whoever jumps on, but uh, how, what's the perception of, of doing that as a listed company today um, with all this focus that is on emissions and, and, and ESG and, and whatnot? Uh, Martin, you unmuted. Yeah. Um, yes. I, I, I mean, I think there's going to be an issue with, with older ships that there's no doubt in coming 2023, although there are suggestions that Europe might kick that back. I see BIMCO came out with something today. But, but, but again, I and mean, there's talk about ships speeding up. We're going to have to slow down. But uh, there is, I agree with Gary, there's no point in buying IFO burning ships that could well be redundant. So we really have to wait for what is going to be the new technology. Is it going to be hydrogen? You know, we, we just don't know. So I think in the meantime, we have to do everything we can to, to limit carbon. You know, obviously we're owners and charters. We're not asking uh, when we take ships on charter to speed up. We're, we're doing it at the most economic level. And, and these levels, it doesn't make any sense at the moment to, to speed up. So no, I, I don't think new buildings are coming. And on our position, of course, we're fortunate with all our Japanese charters, we have purchase options. So we have ready-made fleet updates uh, available to us and, and, and in, in due course we'll sell some of our older ships but no more new buildings and I think the financial markets investor markets have to accept that we are running ships as, as most economically as green as we can however demand is there and uh, and, and we are satisfying the, the, the demand in the best way we can.
Mm. But given the given the incredibly low order book, what what will it take to uh, for you guys to to head to the yard uh, and and book uh, book orders? Given that there's going to be not more than trend growth going forward uh, in terms of demand growth, you're looking incredibly short based on where we are in the market today uh, on tonnage. And so, what's what's it going to take? Um, Damatis uh, can can start if you like. Well, uh, our commitment in uh, high quality second hand tonnage has been more than evident uh, this year. We have grown our fleet by more than 70%. We have bought uh, seven high quality Cape size vessels built in Japan. Um, so we have a very strong commitment uh, on ships that we believe can be tradable and can work very well in the, the next few years. And we're also looking to improve their efficiency and we have been pioneering uh, that field since 2016 by installing energy saving devices and various other uh, investments on board the ships that cost a lot of money. Sometimes in cooperation with the charters, sometimes we do it on our own. But, you know, it's not only uh, gaining a few tons a day, but also it's the, uh, the, the actual improvement of the environmental footprint of the ships. That's what we do. So we feel very confident that this fleet is going to make... Uh, a very significant return on investment in the next few years. And once we have a clarity uh, on the uh, what's going to be the technology of tomorrow and what's going to be the prevailing ship of tomorrow, which we still don't feel comfortable as a company, then we can consider uh, on the basis of financial returns if that makes sense or not. All right, thank you. And uh, Polis, uh, I guess, uh, some way to, to, to match up the the investment in assets these days as well uh, and turning more I guess to the operational side and strategy of things um, uh, how is um, how is the willingness to, to lock in rates I guess at these levels and, and de-risk and secure the investments versus uh, being being open to the spot markets and is that something that's slowly changing or Yeah, we we'll slowly start to invest into longer uh, term charters. Uh, of course, we we do not see the, we do not see availability of five year charters or, or anything like that. Uh, recently, we saw with this boom in the Cape market, we saw three year charters uh, coming along. I know people will say, "Okay, you better keep the ships and earn fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars a day." Uh, Cape size market is not our uh, is not our expertise as such. Uh, we only have five capes, and uh, and uh, we we thought uh, it was reasonable to fix them in the mid twenties for three years. We are happy with this number. It pays you off the investment in three years. You get the ship down to scrap value, a new a newly acquired vessel. So we're happy to get a nine-year-old down to scrap at 12 and then have another eight years to make some good money for the shareholders. So for us that we're not Cape player, we went for three years at the mid-20s on, on a couple of uh, ships in the last few days. And now apart from that, on the, on the smaller sizes like Panamax to post Panamaxes, I don't see yet the three or the... Uh, four-year charters. I only see one-year charters uh, at the moment, but I believe that I believe that uh, in the first half of 2022 we will have the opportunity to lock also on, the, on that part on a good part of our fleet uh, longer charters. From the inquiries I received with spot market approaching or exiting now in the Far East, forty thousand dollars on modern Kamsa Maxis. Uh, I expect people to start knocking the door to lock in three-year charters uh, in the high 20s and uh, probably a little bit over 30 for good ships. So I think that uh, we will be ignorant uh, if we don't lock in at those levels with good names for three years. So yeah. I think it's all coming nicely in the first half of 2022 for for medium-sized vessel like uh, Kamsamax or Postpanamax to receive three-year charters as well. And then um, how about the Eagle Bull? Uh, oh. Yeah, yeah, jump in. That, and jump that, uh, quickly, I actually, uh, our recommendation is actually keep every ship you have um, Supermax up to Cape in the spot market right now. Um, <laughs> The opportunity again, we have to properly weigh opportunity costs because the opportunity cost of having a cape size, for example, um, in the spot market to doing a period 
uh, deal, let's call it a one year deal, and which is much higher than the two is is for is forty thousand dollars a day. So if you're if you're not weighing your opportunity cost properly right now, you're really you could really be giving away a lot. And I'll just go one step further. There's this old saying which I really don't like that says, "Oh well, you don't go broke making a profit." Yeah, well, you're not going to generate a ton of wealth unless you understand what your opportunity cost is. That's it. Thank you. I'll, I think if we can just uh, I, I got a finger up from Stamatis as well, and I'll give you a short comment as well, Polis. A quick point, uh, as far as we're concerned before, I understand that uh, Polis wants to respond to that. Uh, what we are doing and what has worked well for us is that uh, we're, we have almost all of our fleet on time charter basis, but they are on an index link. So uh, we get the benefit of the index, which is a spot market, but we also get a conversion option and that's very, very important. So we, we can convert uh, for forward periods uh, from one month to 12 months into a fixed rate as it comes uh, available to the company on the basis of where we see on an opportunistic basis, of course, for us. So that's something that we've done. It has worked very well for us. We get the premium of the spot market. And when we see the opportunity of a forward rate, we just grab it, but not for two or three years. We just grab it for anywhere between one, two quarters and up to a year. Thank you. Thank you. Just to keep the heat, a short comment from you, Polis. Yes, uh, look, with what John said, I briefly, I, I agree to an extent that uh, we keep, uh, you know, 70 or 80 percent. I don't agree with the 100 percent. The 100 percent is a little bit like playing the casino. I was in Monaco last week. I, I went to the casino. I lost 500 euros. So I don't want to, lo I, I don't want to, I, ha I have my losses there. So I don't want to extend. So 30 percent of the fleet to go into three year chart is not a bad policy and enjoy the spot market with the 70 percent and uh, we don't take uh, make casino style in our business uh, fair enough <laughs> thank you so and then headed over to 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 you gary just a quick comment on that uh, are you are you seeing any potential to to fix up on longer contracts or, or staying to staying to the strategy uh, of being uh, an operator as such well, we're definitely an operator um, and, and where there's fair value, we prefer to use the derivative market to, to lock in, you know, cash flows because it gives us the ability to, to still have our fleet in the market where we, we believe we're able to, we've been able to demonstrate an ability to outperform the index uh, by having 53 ships plus charter in vessels around cargoes and things like that. So, you know, there are times though that the derivative market trades at a significant discount and at those times, then we look to to, you know, we will fix ships out and we talk about it, you know, uh, some on a selective basis. But um, at, the, at the moment, no, nothing beyond uh, 12 months. You know, we think that the backwardation of the market, even for 12 months, is significant. I mean, you look at the spot market today is 38. Next year, the FFA market is 25. You know, for, for you know, our company, that that's an equivalent of a $225 million uh, discount on EBITDA. Right. So, you know, you're talking about a very significant discount, 35 percent to spot. Uh, so, you know, it's uh, it's it's really unique, you know, interesting times here. And these these are high class problems that we all we all face. But but in some ways, we think it's about a balance and having the ships in the market and the ability to to engage and take advantage of the dislocations between the basins and things like that is really important for Ecopol. Yeah. Thank you, and, and I think you, you touched on a very important point there. It seems to, to us at least that uh, there is some disconnect between what you managed to, to get in the period market uh, physically versus what uh, what's tradable in derivatives markets. Is that, uh, is that a fair, fair observation, uh, would you say, Gary, since we're on the point? Well, it, it is, but it, but it definitely, they don't, they don't move in parity. And so we actually take advantage of that. So, you know, without getting too far in the weeds here, you know, when we use a derivative market to hedge a ship, you know, we have the ability to, we buy that back if, if those markets dislocate and, and maybe use, you know, then, uh, you know, fix a ship out for a period of time and then may buy it back, you know, as, as a derivative provides, you know, a, a better opportunity. So it's a dynamic market and having, you know, more levers to pull gives, gives us that ability. But there's no question that the derivative market, and especially this year, we saw the discount relative to physical at, at a bigger discount than we've seen in quite some time. And, and when, when it doesn't provide what we believe is fair value as compared with what is you know, available and opportunity on the physical market, you know, we'll do that. But just when you fix a ship out for one year, 
just again, not, not to get too far in the weeds, right? It's not a year, it's about nine to 12 months. And that option of nine to 12 months, often it's about nine to about 12 and about means 15 days. So now it's eight and a half to 12 and a half months. And that option clearly will be used against you. If the market's high, you'll get the ship back at the end of the period. And if it's low, you'll get it at the beginning. So knowing you know, what, these, what these mean, what these options are worth and comparing them to what's available and for instance, the derivative market or using cargos, we think is an important differentiator. And that gives you know, a company the ability to create value around those things. I, I agree with Gary totally. And the big thing is you don't give away any optionality when you sell paper, zero. When you sell physical, as he said, a one-year charter, you are giving away 50% optionality. There's a price for that, but uh, just normally selling derivatives is kind of, is, is a is a better way than um, than fixing out in the period market because you don't have to give away that optionality. One more thing to add about derivative uh, FFAs and physical, they are two different worlds that meet every day at the index and then go back to being two different worlds. That's how we look at them. Thank you. And then how about uh, on, on your end, Martin? Um, uh, both on, on sort of the, the chartering strategy and outlook and willingness to, to, to book anything in. Are you in agreement with the, uh, with, uh, I guess there are opposed views around the table? <laughs> no, we, we, as we made clear all year long, we, we waited 10 years for this market and we're basically running 90% spot. Obviously, if we're having been around 45 years, we, we, we have a natural cargo book with, with, with our long term. Uh, evergreen contracts at market levels, index levels, which we operate around. And as Gary does, I mean, against that, we'll be taking ships for three to five, four to six months, knowing we've got the first couple of legs covered. And then we have the optionality at the end. And if we can get owners to give us a little bit of a wider spread, and if the market goes against us, we re-deliver. As has happened, it stays in our favor. We have the last two, three, four months at below market levels. So it's something we look at the whole time, but we're very much spot market orientated um, what is interesting starting to see for next year certain cargo and we're, we're very picky you, and you can fix your ship out for 12 months apart from maybe 10 10 charters you'll get your ship back pretty pronto if the market collapses or they'll start flipping them and then you end up with all the problems we're actually seeing some blue chip charters actually coming along and saying actually we think next year could be could be pretty high uh, can we take cover? And if we can book cover at today's levels for a few cargoes, hell, if we're wrong, we're wrong. But if you're, you're, you're wrong on hand is at 35 grand, okay, we'll take it. And, you know, we, we, we move and we hope we're wrong. We hope we're wrong. So it is interesting. I think it took a lot of charters a long time to work out this market was here. It was for real. And, and now that those guys with commodity have to get cover. So, uh, and yeah, we, we, we don't pay the paper anything like the other guys in, in we, we, we do hedge on occasion, but we prefer to, to operate on, on, on the market. But yeah, I, I love Gary's comments. You're right. About nine to about 11. And yeah, you, you're right. And then the guy at the other end, we all try and wander over a few days. You end up in a legal fight. It's a nightmare. So you really got to keep it very, very tight. By the way, I can't let John get all the sayings. You know, we have one options. They're good to get, bad to give, plain and simple. Good. I like that. <laughs> and then, what, what do we? What if we flip it around? So g given that the willingness to, to fix out vessels is is rather rather low, uh, how about taking on capacity? Is that something that's interesting in the current market? Um, I'll leave it for anyone who wants to to answer. Gun to the head, I would be a buyer of this market rather than a seller. If I had to do one of the two, I'm definitely buying, not selling at these at the call at the one year <laughs> level and beyond. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we absolutely, we charter in ships. Uh, we typically will use derivative to lay off uh, a big part of the of the uh, fixed period, you know, creating what we call asymmetric optionality. It's it's definitely part of our business model and, and you know, we think an, an important one. Yeah, and uh, since these uh, earnings that's generated these days aren't going to new builds, um, I guess they're headed to, to shareholders uh, at some point. Uh, what's, uh, what's your take on, on the best way uh, to um, to get uh, an acceptance and, and pricing around uh, sort of more of a yield story in the dry bulk space. I um, don't know if you you want to start off with that. Uh, Martin, you unmuted, so you can go ahead if you want. I'll be just be quickly. Short. F f first thing, straight to the balance sheet, reduce the reduce the, the debt down. There are 
a couple of Greek people on, on this panel. I love the Greeks. Zero debt or very little debt. You always survive in the game. So this, you know, having having survived for the last 10 years, now you reduce your debt down. And yes, we, we introduced a dividend policy, uh, announced it in August. I see Gary's done, done a similar one now. You start to, to, to repay uh, shareholders as well. But with, with one eye on the balance sheet, let's not get carried away. Maybe 12 months from now, we have these earnings, that, then hey, that, then anything is possible. But at the moment, let's put, let, put our balance sheets in a bulletproof way, and then we can move forward because there's going to be great opportunity out there. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll uh, go one step further. It's um, I, I think that the ship owners who have and the, the fact that the shareholders have been through a lot, and I think they should all be rewarded with dividend as much dividend as you can, basis having a rock solid balance sheet, et cetera, et cetera, um, and put money in their pockets. I mean, we've been doing that for years. It's our ethos, and I'm a ship owner myself, and I can tell you what I appreciate is to see my bank account fill up as a result of my ships, not see it drain. So as much as we can to the shareholders. Right. I, I, I guess they're happy. Uh, and, uh, You're never happy. <laughs> no. And that's, as, as Tomate said, do you, do you agree very, very shortly on that? I agree. Uh, we strongly believe that uh, after many, many difficult years. So we're now in the beginning of a cycle that is going to last uh, for quite some time. So we're big believers that, that the current cycle is only at its uh, early stages. And we expect to see some very strong returns uh, for at least, I'm not going to say five years, but at least three years or more. So having said that, uh, now we are starting to gather some cash flow in the company. And we're very strong believers of returning money back to the shareholders. We intend to start doing that very soon. We just haven't decided whether it's going to be in Q4 or Q1 next year or you know, sometime in the first half of next year. We haven't really decided on the timing, but we strongly believe that we should be starting to reward our shareholders as they have been patient with us in the previous very difficult years. Yeah, thank you. And then in the interest of time, uh, we're, we're running a bit short, have a couple of minutes left, but uh, I think it's worth touching a bit on the the particulars on the regulatory side of things, um, and I, I did um, did ask beforehand um, if there was you know if you had the possibility to find any data and numbers on, on this uh, this sort of uh, the impacts and implications of the regulations that we're seeing from 2023, and I think the most tangible one perhaps the EEXI, um, and what I think is interesting is how much. Um, we only have two minutes left, but uh, but uh, but how much <laughs> does that uh, actually impact, you know, uh, your fleet capacity, um, given where you are today, and would you sort of look forward, how, how large would that capacity impact be? Uh, and if we could keep the, uh, the answers very short, I'll try to get around to a couple, if you want to start, uh, Eagle. Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, we've been through a pretty substantial fleet renewal, required 29 ships. So with the exception of two ships, our oldest vessel is 12 and a half years old. So EXI is going to have a very minimal impact on, on, on Eagle bulk. Um, and in fact, if you go back where ships were steaming just, you know, a year ago, right, it would have even less of an impact globally because ships were, were echo steaming today at full speed. We think it'll have a painful impact on the older ships, but very little on ourselves. So uh, we'll be a beneficiaries on a net basis as, as the fleet will be forced to slow down to some extent, to keep it short. And how about uh, on your instances? Well, we have run uh, the study in December of uh, last year and we were very confident that the effect of EXI is going to be minimal to us. Uh, however, it's, it, we are in shock and awe to see that uh, the, the majority of the fleet is going to be impacted by more than 20% and the reluctance of people in getting into the study and assessing how much the reduction is going to be. Uh, from, from various conversations I had with classification societies and a lot of other people, you know, there are certain uh, age um, brackets of ships that uh, can be reduced their power by even 40%. That's 4-0. So, you know, the reluctance of people to realize that uh, if, if, if uh, sulfur dioxide and scrubbers was a, a hill, we're now facing the Himalayas as far as uh, supply reduction is going to be concerned. Yeah. I think we, we just uh, ran out of time uh, on, on that note. Um, so uh, 
Yes, there you are, Niklas. Uh, and thank you so much uh, to, to all the panelists. Uh, I, I guess we could have gone on for another 10, 20 minutes if we wanted to. <laughs> so, we could have yeah. gone on for another 10 or 20 days, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Everyone. Great panel, and uh, thank you so much. Bye, everyone. You can tell from the uh, attendance that uh, you guys are at the forefront. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jorgen. Thanks, everybody. Catch up soon. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe.